on your third and fourth and fifth cycles of compressions, you know, this is, you know, it's time to reevaluate whether you want to continue this resuscitation. Or if you have an obvious fetal reversible cause, you got to really focus on that. Yeah, uh, Just a question. Um, with uh, giving beta blocker after uh, several rounds of epi, uh, could give, it could cause unopposed alpha and cause vasoconstriction globally. Is there any concern about that? So uh, presumably, okay, uh, you haven't had to give too much epinephrine. And remember, you're giving it IV, so you're not putting them on an epinephrine drip. So uh, I guess you would expect that some of the effects from the epinephrine will have sort of dissipated by the time you put them on. Mm -hmm. But that's a good thought on Esmolol. The, the Esmolol mainly is to reduce electrical storm. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not, you're, trying, you're not trying to affect your, uh, your, your uh, vascular, have the vascular maximum. But what we use it for rate control, right? So you're really um, just reducing, you want to reduce the effects of uh, the chances of there's a recurrent VF or a pulse. The evidence is not great for the wall either, but uh, they did do a systematic review on it. Uh, and, and hence the, the 2B recommendation, which is pretty, it's a weak recommendation, right? Limited data. All right, anything else? Okay, let's go to non shockable rhythms now. Non shockable rhythms are basically. Pulses, electrical activity, and asystole, right? So here's the case for this. You get an 80-year-old woman who has a, a history of diabetes, is brought in by her very concerned family because she's had acute altered mental status, okay? These are her vital signs. She's tachycardia. She has hypotension, tachypnea, febrile, and she has a numeric saturation of 90%. On a quick exam, she's lethargic, she has shallow respirations, and uh, dry mucous membrane. So what are you going to do? Okay, good. So you want attention to the space, right? So you, you call an internal sepsis code. Uh, you get all your resources there for volume nursing. Nursing immediately tells you they can't get an IV, right? And um, so you go over to see the patient, and the patient's now unconscious and uh, pulses. You look up on the monitor, you see this. All right, so what's your order of treatment? What is this? What, what is this? PA, right? So what is your order of treatment here? What's first? Right, compressions. What's next? I.O. I.O. what? Okay, I, I think uh, epinephrine was what the algorithm would say, but if too, pretty too quickly you give this and then um, you want to protect the airway, okay? If the patient's unconscious. But you give IO first, uh, address the airway, okay, while you're doing chest compressions. And then um, you can give uh, whoever said Chris fluids is, is right. And these are things are going to happen pretty quickly, right? But this is the order, is how it should happen according to the PEARS algorithm, okay? But whoever said fluids, who said that? Bogosh. Bogosh, oh, right? So, Bogosh <laughs> happens to be pretty smart, so. So, you know, she knows that she's going to have all these things happening fairly simultaneously. This is the order according to the algorithm of the way things should go. Okay? She already knows what this patient has, right? So while you're doing the resuscitation, um, you do a round of chest compressions and uh, give fluid and epinephrine, and the patient gets returned to spontaneous circulation, okay? Uh, the patient's still uptunded, so you decide to remove the LMA, and then um, intubate the patient with ketamine and rocuronium. You place the patient on uh, for analgesia on fentanyl, and uh, vital signs are improved now. Maybe a little bit hypotensive, but uh, better vital signs. So now that the patient's been resuscitated from the PA arrest, you place a central line. Um, and in the meantime, you get, uh, you get your uh, an ultrasound. This is what you see. So now, the patient's kind of more, relatively more stable. You can think about what were the causes of this arrest, right? So what does this suggest? What is the cause? Right, hypovolemia. Now there's probably two other, definitely one other cause, most likely one other cause, and, and possibly another cause, uh, two causes. So, so you have hypovolemia, which is kind of in distributed shock is the same thing for this patient. But what else? Think about how the patient presented. Hypoxemia, right. So, You've addressed that with 
Ventilation, right? And what's the third possible cause that we haven't confirmed with that? Huh? What? Acidosis, right? Acidemia. Maybe not. But acidemia, maybe this patient has a lactic, a lactate of eight, right? Why not? But like high lactate, but a lactic acidemia, in which case your ventilation will, will treat that as well. Right? So those are, this is an example of three reversible causes within the same patient that will be addressed by a proper resuscitation. All right. So now, this is the, the same cardiac arrest, arrest rhythm, uh, algorithm, but we're now we're on the right side of it, okay? We're talking about uh, PA and asystole. So, you don't shock these patients, right? So the, the, the first intervention is what? Right, chest compressions, okay? So you go quickly to chest compressions, you give early epinephrine, and um, in these patients, especially in advanced airway placement mate, is more, probably more important than in patients with BF and pulses PT. Okay, uh, so you do two rounds of compressions. Uh, you do your uh, rhythm check. What else do you want to do at this stage? Your rhythm check, you're going to do a pulse exam. This is where you should fit in your ultrasound, right? Okay? You should do your ultrasounds during your uh, rhythm check to pulse exams uh, so you don't interrupt compressions, okay? So this patient remains in PEA. You have a rested person do chest compressions. You want, again, you want to keep your defibrillator, your defibrillator charged just in case you get a shock of the rhythm. Um, and then address your, or treat your reversible causes. Your team leader's got to be thinking about, you know, H's and T's and whatever else might have caused this arrest. If the rhythm, during a rhythm check that uh, you get a shock of the rhythm, then you shock the patient. Right? and then you move to the other side of the algorithm. You guys all do this in your head. I'm just trying to point this out, like within the algorithm, how it works. Okay? All right, any questions? Shock of rhythms? All right. So, uh, there's a new emphasis on uh, using physiologic parameters to monitor your CPR call, okay? The, um, they, AHA says that we should be using waveform capnography, or end tidal CO2 is one parameter, to, uh, to, the, to really see how well we're doing chest compressions. And end tidal CO2, remember, at, at, you've all used this before, right? We use it for procedural sedation. Um, but we really should be getting used to using it more for a lot of other critically ill patients, yeah. getting nursing used to setting it up and all that, because uh, what it does is, you know, capnography is, it measures uh, the concentration of exhaled carbon dioxide from the ET tube using infrared absorption detectors. Okay, and it's displayed as a ring waveform, like pulse ox. And really, you can use this as a surrogate measure of perfusion. So, uh, during low flow states, like cardiac arrest, uh, you know, the, the, if the ventilation is fixed, your pulmonary blood flow is the, is the main determinant of uh, end tidal CO2, okay? So blood flowing through the lungs. So uh, during cardiac arrest, your end tidal CO2 levels will reflect the cardiac output that's generated by your chest compressions. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So this is probably the easiest thing for, for us to use in the emergency program, but you can also use arterial diastolic blood pressure. So in the units, if you have an arterial line, you can look at your diastolic blood pressure and use that to guide your resuscitation. Uh, but again, it requires an arterial line. It's a good measure of aortic uh, diastolic pressure. And then finally, you could also use a central venous oxygen, oxygenation levels, uh, but that requires a central line and specialized monitoring equipment. So all three of them can be used. I make the uh, entitled CO2 big because I think we should, we, that's the quickest one, easiest one for us to use in the emergency department. Okay, you can also use physiologic parameters to detect return of spontaneous circulation, okay? Uh, so, when the patient regains uh, uh, perfusion, uh, your organs are perfused, your lung is perfused, right? If the lung is perfused, you get better, a more improved alveolar gas exchange, right? So when you get better gas exchange, what happens to your end tidal CO2? 
it goes up, right? Like it goes abruptly, it goes uh, suddenly uh, increases. And that can be used as an indicator of return of spontaneous circulation. And this could be, if you have the patient attached properly, you can see this while you're doing chest compressions. So the benefit is, uh, if you see, while you're, if you're doing your chest compressions, you see a sudden rise in entitled CO2, you might decide to, or you should decide to withhold giving more epinephrine, right? Because the more epinephrine you give, uh, increases afterload and may be harmful to the patient. Right? This is like, this is the way you can use entitled CO2 to guide your resuscitation. So here's a, a, a diagrammatic overview of entitled CO2 values uh, that were recorded before and after um, ROSC in a group of patients with cardiac arrest. These patients had a, a single return of spontaneous circulation and then a stable perfusion. And uh, these, all these different lines are different, or it's basically inside entitled CO2 at different, different uh, percentiles. But uh, the, the time zero was recorded as when providers felt the pulse. And you can see that at time zero, it correlates with an increase in, in tidal CO2 levels. <coughs> One last uh, use of n tidal CO2 is you can use it uh, for prognosis. So um, very low levels after a period of resuscitation may, well, may help you decide when to stop. And they say that you can intubate patients only because Entitled CO2 values are, are a little spurious in uh, patients with LMAs or other supraglottic airways. So in intubation, pa intubated patients, if the entitled CO2 is less than 10 after 20 minutes of chest compressions, you can consider this as one component of, of a bunch to end the, end the resuscitation. And I would say another component is what we all do, right? What do we use? Sorry, what? Ultrasound. Ultrasound, right? Bedside ultrasound, you look at ventricular wall pressure. So you can use, you use two of those things, it's just two, it's one more thing, entitled CO2, bedside ultrasound, to help you make that decision. Okay, any questions on non-shockable rhythms? Uh, using physiologic parameters? Does that make sense? Yeah. Do we have the equipment for entitled CO2 monitor? So we have it, I've been assured that we have it at Downstate. Uh, you know, but you, you got to think about using it. You're going to have to sort of like, you know, nudge the charge most of the setting it up, just like it is with any other <coughs> monitoring. Sometimes we don't use often, but we have to, we have to, I think, take the, take the lead in using this. I, I, in Kings County, I, I, I asked, I haven't gotten a response back where we have it. I know we have it for procedural sedation. And you could also just use your procedural sedation setup if you have to. But they supposedly have it on the big monitors as well. I think some of them. Yeah. Any, else? Any other questions? But it all makes sense, right? The using parameters make sense? Yeah. All right. All right, so placement of advanced airways includes uh, supraglottic airways like LMA and also endotracheal tubes. And you know, so you, you, should, you should only minimally interrupt your chest compressions, right? Um, what is the benefit of? of Placing advanced airways, besides logging the procedure log. <laughs> What's the benefit in cardiac arrest? You don't inflate the stomach, you can continue getting good chest compressions. Okay, sort of, right. So you minimize, gas, you minimize gastric insufflation and vomiting and aspiration, right? And you can allow simultaneous ventilations and chest compressions, right? So that's really the point of why we place it. But the guidelines actually, at your bets here, say you could actually do a resuscitation just with a, a BDM. And there's probably no difference. Uh, and then you can into, place your uh, advanced airway after you get return of spontaneous circulation. None of us are going to do that. But um, they really want you to focus on uh, compressions. Um, but I would say if you're going to place one, and I've seen you guys do this in the rest, is quickly stick in an LMA. Right, and ventilate that way, and then if you when you get a return of spontaneous circulation afterwards, you can properly place it to more definitive endotracheal tube. Yeah. You know, what do you think of the literature that says the LMA is improved with rod and you don't get good cerebral flow despite getting good cardiac flow? Yeah. So that was uh, in in basic science studies. They looked at that. And they found that. But when they look at uh, now the data for for is very limited for 
superglottic areas versus DT2. Some of it has found a benefit for LMA, some has found a benefit for ET tubes, um, and it's all retrospective data. So that actually hadn't translated into any meaningful uh, outcomes in, in humans uh, yet. Yeah. Yeah, one I wrote was a sheet study where they uh, did PET scan on the head, looked at flow, and they had decreased flow due to the brain, uh, to the brain. Uh, I don't know how to interpret it, if, if you do the CPR the same part, but not the brain, I don't know how to interpret it. But we do know that if you take time to, that's correct, if you do take time to intubate, even attending these intubations, you don't have to stop compressions. And we know that that's bad. I'm going to show you why in a second, why stopping compressions can be bad. I have a question. Are the uh, LMAs on both sides of the street intubating LMAs, or do you have to actually remove the LMA? Because I don't think either one is intubating LMA. Pardon? I don't think either one is intubating LMA. No, yeah, we don't have to. Yeah, we don't have to. In the emergency department, I don't think we have it. But if you call anesthesia, they'll have it. Yes, I really hate the idea of removing an LMA Right, and, and you should, but you can leave that in for as, as long as you need to. If you, if you want to convert it, you convert it. Like you can, stay, you can stabilize the blood pressure, all this kind of oxygenation, and then when you're ready to sedate it to be. It's actually like uh, the, the, the advanced area placement is actually part of post arrest care in this algorithm. They say consider it, but you can actually wait until your post arrest uh, period. You also need two changes for intubating elements, and I haven't seen them in a while, in our recall. Those blue things with the, like, the yeah. bridge point in front, I haven't seen them in a while. Anesthesia has been good. Okay, uh, so I mentioned this, but when you interrupt CPR, what happens is the, your coronary perfusion pressure drops, okay? And I'm going to illustrate this with another poor pig right here. It's actually the same pig. <laughs> so it's not, you don't have to go out that. But it's, uh, this is another pig who has, or the same pig who's, who's um, they measured uh, pressures in the aorta and right atrium. There's the aorta in purple, and the right atrial pressure is in yellow. And what they did is they, you can see that they did compressions and uh, built up a pretty good pressure gradient after a number of compressions. But then what they did is they stopped for ventilation. This was basically, they were, this is the study was looking at 2005 versus 2010 guidelines on how to manage it. So they stopped for, to allow two, two ventilations. And you can see that the, pretty quickly, the pressure gradient uh, and coronary perfusion pressure drops to zero. And then it takes a number of compressions to build that up again, build up your coronary perfusion pressure once again. So this is really the, it's an animal, but it's, it, this, is the, this is the rationale behind it, why the, we want to minimize the interruption in chest compressions. So again, uh, AHA says you could place either a supraglottic airway or an endotracheal tube for your advanced airway. Again, based on limited data, retrospective studies. There is a, a study going on right now in Washington State, a paramedic study, which is looking at uh, what is the ideal timing of uh, advanced airway placement to maximize outcomes? And this is, uh, they're looking at the endotracheal tube versus the king tube <coughs> in 3,000 patients. So uh, it's been completed, but we just gotta wait for the results. So we should get more information, or at least more information that we can extrapolate to our patients in the emergency department. Again, I also talked about this, but you can actually consider deferral of the advanced airway and you should for shockable rhythms because it's less important, but deferral until, uh, until there's a failure to respond to initial shock and chest compressions, or even after uh, your resuscitation is successful and you get your return to spontaneous circulation. So this suggests you can use a BBM for the whole resuscitation. Right, it's a weak recommendation, to be. All right. Um, so how do we confirm endotracheal tube <coughs> placement in the emergency department? What? So we use a color, colorimetric and tidal CO2 detector, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you know, and you probably even had some false positives using that, correct? Mm -hmm. So because of, because of that uh, occurrence, they really, they give a class one recommendation to use waveform capnography. Limited data, but that's what they that's what they want us to use now to minimize the the, the chance of false positives. Okay. 
they also meant they also addressed that uh, that you can use the, they mentioned you can use ultrasound. Who's used ultrasound for PT2? For April Yeah, both in conjunction with everything. Very good. Great. So why why do you use ultrasound? because uh, we just read a paper about it in uh, <laughs> because you can um, you can you can tell they, they had a nearly perfect rate of determining esophageal versus um, uh, air, uh, the tracheal intubation um, when used in the proper setting in a blinded trial. Right, so you can directly visualize the two uh, well not you don't you secondarily visualize the two going in the trachea, right? You right. need to see if it goes in the esophagus. But also using ultrasound if it's used to someone knows how to do it, right after that you can confirm it by looking at the lungs to see subsequent sub ventilation. So you can do your primary and secondary confirmation with ultrasound. All right? The systematic review is pretty good actually. Uh, one of my old, one of my, I mean my med school roommate actually was one of the authors of that. It was done out of Maimonides. And, uh, it's, uh, it was enough to be mentioned in the guidelines. But they haven't really put it in the algorithm yet, but you, know, you can consider doing that too if you're good at it. Okay. Uh, perform ventilations at 10 per minute. 10 per minute is not very fast, right? But all, everyone, everyone, when they ventilate, ventilate, hyperventilates. And when they studied this, they found that in cardiac arrest situations, that ventilation was performed inappropriately at rates greater than 25. Okay? And what another study has shown is if you, the, as you increase your respiratory rate, what happens to your end tidal CO2? What do you think happens? It drops. Okay, so increased respiratory rates lead to reduced uh, end tidal CO2, which is remember as a surrogate measure of perfusion. And do not hyperventilate. So that's a that's a big a big recommendation uh, that we all have to keep in mind. Uh, what happens when you hyperventilate? What does positive pressure ventilation do? Decreases the pressure. What? How does it so? 